You know how they say too much of a good thing can be bad? Well, this isn't one of those things. Hello everybody, I'm Garrulous64, and Sonic Rush Adventure isn't bad, but it's also not amazing. I don't know what the general consensus on this one is, since I hear even less people talk about this game than the original Rush, but what could possibly be wrong with more of this? If you joined me for the Sonic Rush review, pro tip, it's in the card right up there if you didn't, you'll remember that I praised the hell out of this game. It just showed up back in 2005 and created an entirely new gameplay style for the series, and we're still using that gameplay style today, albeit at the cost of removing 90% of the charm from it, but, you know, it's just a direct downgrade, it's alright, whatever, I don't care. Point is, when you have something that works, it's only natural to start thinking about a sequel, and in 2007, we finally got one. Firstly, I just want to bring on the applause for how nice all the 3D cutscenes are in this game. They run at a great frame rate, and the added bonus of having this over this really makes you feel like you're actually gearing up for a new venture. La la. Yeah, I know, it's the title theme, it's a funny joke, alright, keep going. Being a direct sequel, Sonic Rush Adventure doesn't change up the formula that much. You're once again playing as Sonic and Blaze, and they boost homing attack and hover through a ton of new stages that range from okay to great, let me tell you. And of course, who could forget the tricking mechanic? That is thankfully back again. And much to my delight, you can not only trick off more things than ever before, but you can also activate the legendary Omega Trick! Yeah, honestly, at this point, you can hardly even hear the music because the sound effects get so loud. I don't know if that was the best design choice. I, I kind of wish you could turn them down in the options menu or something, but that's neither here nor there, I guess. And thankfully, you can just look the songs up on YouTube, of course, and just mute the game, and I actually ended up doing this a bit here and there so I could actually give an opinion on the game's soundtrack, which, unfortunately, that's where my criticisms of the game begin. I'll give it that this game's soundtrack is a lot more varied than Rush's, but honestly, not as many of the songs really got my blood pumping like the original game's OST did. That's not to say that there aren't some straight-up bangers in this game, but not as many that I can call out by name, that's for sure. Now, no adventure would be complete without a story, and a story this game has... Oh boy, does it have a story, with characters, and a plot. If my awkward tone of voice isn't really filling you in on what this is getting at, it's not really anything special. It's basically just big bad guys doing something bad, go stop him, but we also have some admittedly very nice character moments, which pretty much makes it up for me. Like, where things are very basic in terms of plot and how it progresses, the characters themselves and their interactions are really well written, and I really enjoy them. But unfortunately, that comes to the cost of having to bear witness to one of the worst things to ever happen to this franchise. Much like in the first Rush title, this game introduces a new character to the series. But we'll get to that in a second. Kicking things off, Sonic and Tails are flying the tornado when they decide to reenact the Titanic, except in a way cooler fashion. The duo then wakes up, stranded on some beach that they don't recognize, and the plane is toast! And even worse than that, there's sand everywhere and they'll never get it out of their socks. But I'd gladly take sand covering everything I own for the rest of my life if I could prevent that fateful meeting that occurs shortly after this. An unnamed orange menace appears from the depths of hell to greet our heroes, and Sonic immediately has the correct reaction to the situation. Call it a premonition, I suppose. This is Marine the Raccoon, the new main character that I alluded to before, and if it wasn't obvious, I don't like her. Like at all. I have a tiny bit in my notes about it, and apparently she was able to exist in front of me for seven minutes before I got sick of her, and when I say someone is worse than Charmy, yeah, that's a huge problem considering Marine isn't in half as many games as him. One day passes, and Sonic and Tails have had enough, so they decide to craft a nifty little water bike. But, you know, Tails for some reason built enough space on the thing for three people, so Marine tags along anyway. Right here, we're introduced to another of this game's main gimmicks. Dimps and Sonic Team saw Legend of Zelda Phantom Hourglass and must have thought it was pretty cool. The result of that is that they decided to add several sailing minigames instead of just letting us go from stage to stage the easy way. Some might like this, some might not. I can see both sides, since things like the jet ski are pretty fun, but as the game goes on and you have to rely on the less exciting vehicles, that's where my interest drops off. Much like Phantom Hourglass, from your starting position, you plot a course and then sail to your chosen destination. But unlike Phantom Hourglass, you don't get confirmation that you'll actually land where you want to land before you set off. This means that if you're even a pixel out of range of the island or event that you're traveling to, Tails will just go, Oh, whoopsie daisy, guys! There's no land to land on here! Let's go back to the island! Instead of just pressing on for like two more seconds and reaching the destination. Your expedition can also be put on halt if your path is obscured by a landmass you didn't intend to draw through, but thankfully they thought ahead and made it so you could reroute from that point if you still have fuel to spare. 
really, all of this could have been avoided if they just let you know whether you'd end up where you're trying to go before you start the minigame, thus cutting down as much time using this dumb, stupid, boring boat as possible. There are four different minigame playstyles in this game. The jet ski, which controls almost identically to the special stages from the first rush, i.e. really well. The boat, which if you couldn't tell by my previous comment, is dumb and stupid. Tails pilots the thing at a snail's pace and you just fire at enemies and it's just stupid, it's, it's dumb, I hate it. We also have the hovercraft and the submarine. The hovercraft is actually fairly entertaining, but it amounts to just mashing L and R to spin and firing blasts to clear mines occasionally. And the submarine is almost a rhythm game, but not really. It's kind of the best way to travel by the end of the game since it goes a lot quicker than the other things and it has a very good range. But my preferred way would have been the jet ski since, like I said, it's actually fun, which is usually the reason I play video games. Upon reaching the island, the gang finds a ton of mushrooms and Marine says she's gonna eat one and I'm all for it. Heck, might solve one of the game's biggest problems so far. Strength. This day just keeps getting worse. The first stage in the game, aside from the tutorial, is Plant Kingdom, a stage full of huge mushrooms, trees that give me sad D&D flashbacks, but that's a story for another time, and of course plenty of places to get your trick on, including the new level intro, where every stage you have the opportunity to get some tricks in and fill your boost meter by jumping off the starting platform. It's here that I also discovered a nice little easter egg in the form of Sonic's various animations. If you were to hold right and press R when jumping off a spring or any other stage element with spring-like properties, Sonic's windmill kick from Sonic Advance 2 makes a comeback. And that's not all, something I praise Dimps for in that game as well, the unique bouncing animations from Music Plant are also featured in this game when Sonic bounces off the giant mushrooms. And here's a small fun fact about that, Red Hot Sonic told me that they're a reference to Rystar, a game that I still really want to play but haven't gotten around to yet. Not sure where these sprites appear, but man, in a game where I have a handful of complaints in terms of gameplay, little things like this really brighten up the mood a little bit. Sonic then notices that he's somehow stumbled onto Jurassic Park and squares off with a giant robot T-Rex, which is incredibly easy to destroy, but long neck mode really saves the entire thing. Look at him, he's so tall, I have no choice but to respect him. Sonic returns to the group after casually putting that T-Rex back in the ground and says nothing about it to anyone. I don't know if it's a random moment of bad writing or if Sonic just really didn't think it was a big deal. Marine and her crew then take a trip to an island made entirely of metal, and they find a ton of robots just chilling out, and Sonic slaughters all of them because all he knows is war. Machine Labyrinth looks really confusing at first, but after replaying it a ton, I can say that the levels in Sonic Rush Adventure are a lot easier than the ones in Rush, and they don't attempt to kill you with the new player traps quite as much. Boss 2 is a huge pendulum, and while I think it's a fun idea, hitting its variously sized balls back and forth is only entertaining for so long. Yep, I really wrote that in the script, I guess. At this point, the game reveals two new tidbits for you. One great, and one really, really bad. If you haven't been paying attention up to this point, every time you finish a level, you receive materials, and you get more of each depending on your ranking. The purpose of these is to pad out the game's length, almost a full two hours more than the original. You see, you need to build all your vehicles, which means you need to collect enough materials to do so. If you don't have enough, guess what you gotta do? If you guess turn off the game and do something else, that's a valid idea, but it won't help you build the sea Beyblade, now will it? What you need to do is replay the levels over and over until you're able to build what you need. While I do like the gameplay, there was one point in my playthrough where I just had to play the final act of the final level four times in a row so that I could finish the game, and at that point makes washing the dishes that have been piling up in my sink look more fun than continuing to play this. Once the boat is built, the crew and marine set off towards another island, and thankfully you're able to set sail from any major location you found on the map, which is the good tidbit I brought up a second ago. Thankfully they had enough common sense to let you do that, or else I probably wouldn't have finished this thing. On the way, we run into a cocky green character that asserts that he's faster than Sonic could ever be on his chosen form of transportation and challenges us to a race. Sorry, Johnny, we already have someone who fits that description back home. We're gonna have to vote you off the island. This scripted event is how you come across the special stages of this game for the first time. Using the jet ski, thankfully, you race Johnny as he does what Sonic NPCs do best and repeats the same three voice lines over and over until you whoop him and take the Chaos Emerald for yourself. Also, no one reacts to the fact that you just randomly found a Chaos Emerald, which I find weird, but regardless, you better get ready to bring your A-game on these things because they get hard. Like, so hard that you can't beat them. Like, literally, you cannot finish some of them until you upgrade your jet ski, and you know what that means. <laughs> And it gets worse because you also can't just choose to upgrade the vehicle you want, you need to upgrade them in the order you got them, which means you need to upgrade everything once before you can get the second bike upgrade. You could've just dropped a menu in there? Pick which one you want to upgrade? I don't know, there's a lot of tediousness in this game that could've been avoided. 
I just don't like the system at all. I, I feel like if they wanted to lock these races behind upgrades, Johnny should have said something like, you think he could beat you with that thing? As if, and then rejected your race. Just be upfront about it instead of having him rubber band on you right at the end of a race just because you don't have the upgrade you needed. The only saving grace to these Johnny races is that his location isn't randomized on the map every time you play. All you need to do is wander into his neck of the woods to challenge him. Your first time through, you could use a guide, or if you like aimlessly boating around, be my guest. As the story continues to progress, the gang discovers a cave, and this is where things really get rolling. Coral Caves is a beautiful submerged cavern that apparently holds something incredible. That being Blaze the Cat. She's here. Hooray. But that's kind of weird, because she went back to her own dimension last game. We're in Blaze's dimension? Man, Sonic and Tails ain't in Kansas no more. <laughs> That could be catastrophically bad, considering the Chaos Emeralds are here, too. Remember all that stuff about imbalances from the first game? Yeah, me neither. Let's pretend that's not real. The cave also hides a new villain that's looking for a powerful artifact, and he doesn't look like anyone we've ever seen in the Sonic series before. He's totally working alone. Sonic and Blaze take down the Ghost Kraken, another battle that submerges you in water, but like the Egg Turtle in the first game, they're very lenient with the drowning, so don't stress out over it. From this point on, the game falls back on the whole, hey, there's an island over there, so maybe we should check it out thing, and then you either go there, or you go build a new vehicle to reach it. Blaze is available from this point on to play in whatever level you want, whether it be a main course or a side level, of which there are several, and some even reference the original Sonic Rush, borrowing gimmicks from them, or even recreating the entirety of Leaf Storm Act 1. A couple of these hidden islands also have this weird cutscene at the end that shows the gang finding something and then just walking away. Maybe just remember that for later. Around this time is when the Soul Emerald missions start popping up as well. Unlike the last game, you need to collect both sets of emeralds, which I am all for, but the way they did this confuses the heck out of me. At first, this koala here will tell you that he's located one of the emeralds and that Blaze should go get it or whatever, and you gotta talk to Marine to start the mission. Maybe it's best if you just let him be lost, because I don't really want to talk to her. These missions start out as being rematches against the bosses, except this time you play as Blaze. So you might be thinking, you just refight all the bosses, right? That's how I remembered it. But no, they decided to make it complicated and stupid. Some of the Soul Emeralds are found after refighting bosses, but the others are found by exploring hidden islands. That doesn't sound so bad, right? Well, it gets better, just wait. You find an island, complete it, and then you get a message saying you unlocked a new mission. You go to the Marine, but she doesn't have the Soul Emerald mission. So you go talk to the Koala, and he unlocks the mission for you, so you can select it from Marine's menu, and then you play the same level again, except it's slightly different, or maybe not at all, because I didn't even notice. And the best part is, I played one of these with Blaze the first time through, and they just made me do it a second time? Like, okay, whatever, guys. I would have been totally fine just refighting bosses, but, you know, who doesn't love confusing nonsense and wasting time? Oh, most people? That's kind of weird. Maybe Dimps thought the opposite. And that, I think, is the last dumb thing I need to talk about regarding this game. From here on out, it's all smooth sailing. If you can call this smooth. The haunted ship houses some cannons that shoot you through the air, and some weird chess gimmick that's really not fun, but the music is a bop, so I'm all for it. Also, I refer to this stage as Pirate Storm the entire time I talked about it in my notes, because apparently I was thinking about Secret Rings, and I guess it's also because Haunted Ship is a really boring name. This is also the only place in the game where having a boss be called the Ghost Anything makes sense. Speaking of which, the Ghost Pirate feels like something right out of Peter Pan. You duel a pirate robot on both the deck and the mast of a ship, and it is super fun. I play Blizzard Peaks next, I think you have the option of choosing between it and Sky Babylon, or at least that's how the game frames it. Kind of a nice switch up, as you have to go through every other level in a predetermined order. There are more callbacks in this level, including a snowboarding section that harkens back to Sonic 3 and Knuckles, except they do way more with it and it actually gets sorta hard when they bring it back for one of the secret levels. The boss fight of this one's actually really unique too. They call it the Ghost Whale, despite the fact that it's obviously a robot, and you run around in the thing's insides to get to the weak point before the timer runs out, and it feels almost like Race to the Finish from Smash Bros. Sky Babylon is a level that takes place in the sky. 20 points to whoever was able to figure that one out. Since Babylon is in the name, I have to again mention the comparison between Johnny and Jet. This definitely wasn't a coincidence, and I'm pretty sure Sky Babylon is Blaze's version of Angel Island and Babylon Gardens put together. Also, hot take maybe, and no pun intended since it's about Blaze, but Blaze is just the Soul Dimension counterpart of Sonic. Like, I'm not the only one who thinks this, right? Like, they wear practically the same shoes, they have very similar powers, they both fight an Eggman. I'm not gonna budge on this, fight me. Sky Babylon was probably my favorite level, I think. The platforming felt really great, and I really spiced my way through the entire thing, and when I finished it, my heart and brain just felt really good. The boss for this one takes place in a three-dimensional space as you wait for it to attack, and then when it does, you get thrown onto the top screen to launch a counterattack. 
feels awkward for a bit, but once you get used to it, it's really imaginative and entertaining, and plus, even though the gameplay style looks like it changes drastically, it doesn't actually play very different from what you're used to. Once you've taken care of the Ghost Condor, the team finds their way to Pirate's Island, again a very creative name, but they aren't able to enter it thanks to a snazzy puzzle lock. Captain Whisker ingeniously tells the gang that they need to go find clues to rotate the pieces in a certain way, and this is actually the last negative thing I have about the game for real this time. Remember those seemingly meaningless Hidden Island cutscenes? Well, you gotta go play those levels again now that you know that you're looking for clues. Sure, the levels aren't that long, but I don't really see any reason why Tails couldn't have just gone, hey, this looks important, maybe we should take a note of this symbol. But after everything we've seen with this game so far, I guess convenience wasn't really the first thing on Dimp's mind when they made this. Once you've gone back and gotten all those, quite possibly my favorite section of the story takes place. The gang is about to shove off for Pirate's Island again when they decide that enough is enough and they kick Marine off the squad. Not exactly kicking her off the moving boat like I would have done, but this is probably just as painful to her as that. Blaze is literally my hero. Pirate's Island reminds me of Water Palace from the first game because of its bright visuals and architectural design. There are some catapults here that launch cannonballs to break pathways open for you, and you'll also be aided by some friendly dolphins from time to time, which in true Sonic Rush fashion will get you killed at some point if you're not careful, but thankfully they're not as annoying to pilot as the rockets from Deadline. And finally, after 400 million hours of sailing, the gang closes in on Captain Whisker and Johnny, who just decided he's a villain, not a rival. I love team-up fights like this, but watching this play out is embarrassing for them. Johnny and Whisker desperately jump around trying their best to send me to Davy Jones, according to the captain, but no matter what they do, the buzz saws that show up halfway through the fight are the real boss. This dope actually tries throwing Johnny at you every so often, and he ricochets around the arena like a torpedo, and while that's awesome, it's hardly effective, and you trash them all the same. Johnny dips, favoring self-preservation over his mission, and Whisker seems worried that someone's gonna be mad with him for losing to Sonic and Blaze. Gosh, I wonder who that could be! There's some weird bit next with Whisker threatening to tickle Marine or something, I don't want anything to do with this, but then apparently behind this boring text conversation, Marine is being attacked by this thing, Ain't that swell. Or big swell, rather. Here's our end of story, boss, folks. This giant thing really radiates Bomber Barbera energy, except this fight overall is a lot less intense. You're primarily trying to get the bot to target the shield, protecting the cannons on either side of the arena so they shatter. Then you'll be able to launch yourself at the boss to land a few hits. It may not be as challenging as the last game's fight, but it's still a nice cap to the adventure. And make sure you're listening closely to the battle theme, because you can actually hear a little bit of Wrapped in Black in there. God, I live for these little references. Sonic and Blaze take out the trash and look amazing doing it, and that's when the credits roll. No conclusion to the story or anything, that's just it. Well, they also do drop a little teaser for something we already expected since we first saw Whisker, but let's pretend to be surprised for Dimp's sake. Once you're thrown back into the game, you're allowed to start upgrading your vehicles to procure the rest of the emeralds, and that's when disaster strikes. Someone's stolen the Jeweled Scepter and is causing a slew of natural disasters! Oh man, dude, bro, it's those egotistical Eggman twins, bro, that's so crazy, I can't believe they're in this game! With the Scepter, they pretend they're stronger than both sets of emeralds, and then they take off towards the center of the Earth to make sure they're strong enough to build an amusement park. And that is just such a lame ambition to have when you're holding the power of literal gods in your hands. I mean, heck, cure all disease in the world, stop the ice caps from melting, get Dash Pass for free for DoorDash, it's great, that, I mean, you could do that. Sonic and Blaze give chase, have more character moments that make me really admire the writers, and then we bear witness to what could have been the coolest super transformation in the series if it was just a little bit longer. I just loved seeing all 14 of the emeralds swirling around Sonic and Blaze, it's such a cool visual. Finally, final battle time, it's the Egg Wizard. As someone who plays strictly magic-based classes in D&D, I can get behind this. Super Sonic for once doesn't spend his time ramming into projectiles, since this time he's got a reflect move that sends attacks flying back at the boss. Burning Blaze comes equipped with her fireball attack yet again, and like the previous game, she is a lot more fun to play as than Super Sonic. And thanks to the fact that you don't need to switch between them at all, there's not really a reason to, if you don't want to, you can just stick with her for the entire three-phase fight, have a ball. A fireball. 
The only oddity here is that they recycled Blaze's voice clip from the last game's final fight, so whenever you switch to her, she just screams, I know! And it's like, what do you know that I don't? I, I really, I would love to know. This boss fight is leagues better than Rush's, and in fact, it might be my favorite super battle in the entire series. It feels really hectic with all the projectiles being launched at you, and it's thrilling to switch to Supersonic for a couple seconds just to bat some fire dragons away before letting Burning Blaze get back to doing her thing. You'll totally see what I mean if you give this game a look. The docks eventually find themselves at the end of the rope, big surprise when Eggman Nega gets the bright idea to charge up a blast that could just destroy the entire planet, Frieza style. Marine does whatever this is, seriously, did we ever establish that she has laser hands? Because I'm a little bit worried about the trash talking I've been doing if she can interrupt this supposed all-powerful entity with one tiny blast. Then the rest of this encounter goes the same as every other song and dance in this series, and it's finally time for Sonic and Tails to head home using the dimensional travel machine that Tails just casually whips up. He's a smart boy. Straight A's. Good job. Very proud. Blaze initiates the handshake with Sonic this time around, and then the duo speeds off into the sunset as Blaze pushes Marine off the dock, ending Sonic Rush Adventure for real this time. What a happy ending for all parties involved. I have some conflicting feelings about this game, since while I was playing it, I had a lot of complaints, which my editor Andrew can attest to, but upon stewing on it for a few weeks and reading back my notes, I feel like I had a great time playing this game, and the ending got me feeling some kind of emotion and everything. I just really love the dynamic between Sonic and Blaze above all else in this game, like if it wasn't obvious, and it's a shame that they haven't explored it again this in-depth to this day. I'm just gonna end this off by saying that if you enjoyed the first rush, you'll probably enjoy this one as well, since the levels provide more of the same action, that is, if you're able to stomach the in-between sections, which I almost couldn't. Though that also means you're gonna have to sit through seven hours of Marine, so I changed my mind, zero out of ten. I know I say this at the end of a lot of these videos, but this took literally forever to write and record because of so many things. But anyway, if you like this video and you haven't already, please make sure you subscribe, click the bell, follow my Twitter, and join the Discord to keep up with more Sonic review things and other things that aren't Sonic review things, because I do a lot of things! I'd also like to give a huge thank you to my current supporters, who are... SonicVidsYT, CommonCJ, Danny Dauber, MikeTGC, SilvaPhD, Raiden Still Plays, Chaosk, Cosmic Mushroom, Chaotic Mercenary, Tylil, Tech Guy, Jaded Indolent, J Remy, Lucas Tallman, Mega Traffic Cone, Crystal, and on Patreon we've got AJ Rat and Rob Morrison. And of course, thank you to everyone in the $1 tiers as well. Thank you so much for supporting, it really means a lot, and if you have any interest in becoming a supporter yourself, check out the join button beneath the video or the card at the top of the video to see my Patreon. You get perks such as bonus videos that only members can see, such as usually blooper episodes, but this week I have a music video for the song you're hearing right now that is made by Ender Electrix on YouTube. Check out him in the description. You can only see that if you're a member, and you can even get the download for it if you really want to listen to it. But uh, also thank you to Ender Electrix for the song, and thank you to Andrew of course for editing as always. Uh, and thank you for watching, I really appreciate it, so thank you so much, and I will see you guys next time.